Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. Previously, I've made forays into focused kinds of masterclasses. The most popular example on my site is Fast Track Training, which gives people the opportunity, especially people that are just beginning in PixInsight, a great way to start processing their images very quickly. The course is structured and methodical in such a way that people really grasp the understanding necessary to have a firm foundation in image processing. Well, I've just created another course that I hope is of that same kind of quality. This one is called Stretch Academy. Stretching images is the most critical element of processing data in terms of the workflow. I mean, this one is really important because once you have employed a particular stretch, you have made concrete a number of different decisions and choices uh, that will affect what follows from there. So understanding you know, what kinds of stretches are necessary, how to use PixInsight to stretch images, what are the processes that are available. I want to take people from the how-to to the know-how, and Stretch Academy is such a course for just this. Stretching images is such a vast, a kind of large space to work within, it literally requires a course, and to my knowledge, no one has really ever dedicated a master class on this particular topic and I wanted to bring this to you. So in this video, I'm gonna highlight some of the key concepts, not all of them, but just a few things to give you a taste of the kind of material you'll find in Stretch Academy. And uh, this is like my other courses, like Fast Track Training, where if you are not already a member, if you're already a member of my site and you have fundamentals, this is already included in that, um, in the full library of videos. But uh, if you just start with uh, Stretch Academy, you could apply the cost of this particular course towards buying fundamentals. And then ultimately, what you're going to want to do is get Horizons, which is the very best example of what I do as a top astrophotographer. You can see in detail all of the decisions I make as far as processing are concerned. So... Stretch Academy is a wonderfully focused masterclass, and let me just show you uh, some of the elements of the course, and you can take away a little bit of information uh, within this video, and hopefully you'll be wanting more, so uh, check it out. In Stretch Academy, I begin with the basics, with an understanding of how to interact with our images and, of course, use the processes in PixInsight that allow us to make adjustments to them. I have found that one of the more challenging processes, especially for people that are just getting into PixInsight, is the screen transfer function process. It is the way in which we can visualize our images, our data on the screen. And of course, that's critical to be able to understand how we're going to be making these adjustments. So one of the creative ways that I try to teach, and I'm just going to be showing you a number of aspects of Stretch Academy, and this is just one of the very first things that I did, is I wanted to highlight how to use the STF process in a way that I think will make it easier for many people. So let me explain first that when we look at the screen transfer function process, there are carrots in the window. These carrots describe, at the very right, we have the white point, the midtones uh, value, and then, of course, the black point on the left. And these carrots, we can, we can adjust. We can make adjustments to them. Of course, what everyone knows how to do, uh, everyone knows to press the nuclear button and create the auto STF. This is going to create a screen stretch that is calculated from the histogram of brightness values in the image. So we'll do that here. Now this image is a straight up linear RGB image. It has not yet been color corrected. So as you can see, uh, there is this bias in color. I'll show you about the unlinked STF in just a moment, which everyone generally knows as well. But there's a big problem here. What often happens is that People may or may not know what these carrots mean, of course I explain, but furthermore, depending upon the kind of image that you have, the black point and the midtones value, they may be so squished 
over to the left side, because this is linear data, once you have done this auto stretch, that they almost look like a single carrot, or they may be so far to the left that you, you, it doesn't even look like there's anything there. And so it becomes very difficult for people to either find them and manipulate them. It's hard to even know to zoom into here. So one of the ways that I try to make sure that people don't miss this information is to do a special kind of stretch here, not stretching the image, but stretching the process window. What you can do is take the screen transfer function process and stretch it across your desktop. Make it really, really big. And then you'll find it's kind of like a natural zoom factor, if you will. You'll find that the black point in mid-tones carrot will very likely be visible over on the left side. You can see the white point on the right and the black point and mid-tones here on the left. And that makes it easier to zoom in. You can either press the button for the zoom mode here and click between the two carrots to zoom in, or you can just use your mouse wheel like this and zoom in or zoom out. And that makes it easier, of course, to manipulate them. If we wanted to make an adjustment, we can you know, therefore, thereby go ahead and adjust the mid-tones, the black level, increasing the contrast, whatever it is that we might want to do. So perhaps you haven't seen that suggestion before. This is the kind of stuff I like to do in Stretch Academy. Uh, let me just offer another thing that often escapes people's notice, which is I think that many people um, very quickly begin to understand how useful it is to unlink the channels so that it will apply the auto screen uh, transfer function, that automatic screen stretch on each of the channels individually. When you have this linked, it, it's going to apply just on the lightness of the RGB image, but that single uh, lightness to all three channels, uh, that calculation to all three channels in the same way. But when we unlink them, and then we do this calculation, of course, it's going to basically get rid of the bias because it's going to align, um, remove basically the pedestal uh, value between the channels and also kind of get the signal strengths to be similar to one another. So you get what looks like a color balanced image. Now, this is not a color corrected image at all, but it can be close, especially if you happen to be using filters and things like that, that kind of give you a one-to-one -one kind of response. But what I want to show you is the following. This image right now, remember, this is not color corrected and it's still kind of this weird green thing. If I were to link the channels and, and do that, it's still in this form, right? It's just that by unlinking, we get kind of this um, adjustment to each of the channels independently. Here's what I want to show you. Once you have done that calculation, and let's say now in this form, this is still a linear image. It has not been color corrected, but I now want to change the brightness of it. And I want to change the brightness of it without messing up the color balance. You can roughly do that if you now relink the channels. Then you can make an adjustment here of the overall brightness. You can change the background and all of that kind of stuff. And it's going to keep these uh, calculated values for the black point, the mid point, and even the white point if it were adjusted in the same relative positions. Uh, if I did not do that, if you kept it unlinked and you tried to make an adjustment, of course, you're going to be adjusting these things independently and just going uh, all weird with the colors and you wouldn't want to do that. So the trick to doing this is step one, do the automatic screen transfer function, then link the channels back and make your adjustments. This can sometimes be useful, again, for visualizing for purposes of a well, number of purposes. Maybe you're going to try to figure out where particular issues are for using DBE or a number of other kinds of examples. So that's another thing to, uh, to consider when using the STF process. Now that we've been talking about color channels, let me show you something else that sometimes goes unnoticed. You'll see here, because we do have this in this unlinked state when we do this automatic screen stretch as I have here, you'll notice that the, the values in each of the channels is different, right? But if we had a color corrected image, what we'll find is that we're gonna have very similar values for an auto uh, stretched image like this. So here, let's, I'm gonna go ahead and do it uh, linked. I've stretched the image in the link form. And what I think everyone understands 
is they might adjust this image to make it look however it is, that might be too much, however it is they might want the image to appear, and then they will drag this to the histogram transformation process, and you'll see the values get populated right here. That means we did the job correctly, and then we can apply to the image. Uh, and these are just setting the black point, the white point, and of course the midtones value. Uh, but what I want to show you is, notice if I did the same thing over here. You remember, these are now set at these different positions, right? If I now, and let me just make sure this is very clear, if I now drag this down to here, notice that nothing changes. Why? You saw what I did here, right? I took the values, I dragged them down to here, and we get numbers. I take this image, and I drag it down to here, and nothing changes. Not in these values. That's the key. Because when we have this image, you've got to remember this image is only looking kind of somewhat reasonable, uh, and that's only because we're using the unlinked automatic stretch here. But that applies different levels of stretch, if you will, to each of the channels. So it doesn't make sense the two, when we drag this here, that these numbers are going to change. It's not a general brightness for all the channels identically. Instead, you need to look at each of the channels individually. These values are being transferred down here, but you only get to see them when you look at the individual channels. That really trips people up because they don't understand why sometimes they think the tool's not working. They're dragging it down here and they're not seeing a change, right, before they apply, but it is changing. It's just located in the individual channels themselves. Now, in Stretch Academy, one of the ways that I approach trying to explain the different kinds of stretches is to talk about the shapes of the curves that are being generated by the processes that are being used. So instead of looking at numbers, I just say, look at the shapes of the curves. That's all you need to do. That contains all the information you really need to know. And that's easier to very quickly appreciate and to use when you're trying to make decisions about stretching your data. Now, to do that, then, you need to appreciate, well, what function is being used by the screen transfer function or histogram transformation. And there is a particular function. It is just um, expressed in the documentation. That function is what's being displayed here on the screen. Anytime you make an adjustment to the midtones value, you are changing one of the parameters in this midtones function. And depending upon how much you change the midtones value, where you position it, determines how bright things become. It determines, or how faint they become, the dim they become. It determines the shape of these curves. What's kind of cool is that many people think that when they adjust, uh, you know, the midtones value here in some way, it, maybe a lot of people think that this is a gamma correction. It is not. That is actually a different curve. So PixInsight is using a very particular function uh, to adjust images by manipulating the midtones value. Uh, one of the things that I do show in Stretch Academy is I show, well, what do gamma curves look like? They look like this. Now, you know, they kind of look similar. They are certainly of that uh, kind of family of curves. They rise very, very, very quickly and then bend over. But you'll find that if you actually compare them for the similar kind of values, and this is one of the things I demonstrate, you can actually see that there are differences between the curves. So they really are, of course, very different functions. I spell that out, but more important than kind of explaining that background is also explaining literally the shapes of input-output curves is all you need to know. It's the way in which I demonstrate or teach how to adjust these tools. So if you look here, you can see that I've made like diagrams which show what each of these things does. Uh, you can imagine obviously the straight diagonal line does nothing. It's basically saying for a given input value, you have exactly the same output value. That's the identity curve. So a curve like this, which I'm sure everyone knows, is a curve that would brighten things. And a curve that looks like this, a, con, a concave kind of curve here, is going to make things dimmer, especially more strongly in the midtones. But that curve doesn't need to extend across the entire dynamic range of brightnesses. It could be a curve that only exists within a particular subset 
of values within the data. And this is where we get to selectively adjust the brightness or contrast within a range of values in an image. You can use curves transformation to do this, but one of the more powerful ways, of course, doing these kinds of adjustments is with GHS, the Generalized Hyperbolic Stretch Process. And that's what I'm going to indicate next here, but I just wanted to show you on the screen just shapes of curves. And then once you see those shapes, you can very quickly say, I know what's going on because it's a line and the line is tilted this way or that way that instantly gives you a sense of what kind of adjustment you're going to see in the image you're working on. If you visit the website, you can see all of the topics that are currently being covered in Stretch Academy. I still think I have more to make. In particular, I think I want to make some that are object specific, like stretching a globular cluster and things like that. But I do, of course, demonstrate and provide the data for some very interesting examples. You'll notice here that I have particular kinds of stretching, including slow stretching, masked stretch, and because of its popularity and very large parameter space, uh, an explanation of GHS is also a, a big featured part of Stretch Academy. In fact, let me just go ahead and show you that uh, one of the images that I provide data of is of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and I show how to stretch that in an optimal way using GHS. But by far, I think the most dramatic example of stretching is the Orion Nebula. Any stretching methodology, no matter what it is, if you can stretch an object like the Orion Nebula and make it look reasonable, then you've really got that stretching kind of method uh, nailed down. Because it is the most challenging, I think, object that you could use. In fact, no one, as far as I know, uses the Orion Nebula as an example for good reason. But it is a wonderful example, especially for a um, process like GHS to show how multiple stretches uh, become very important if you want to be sure to maintain the detail and contrast within the nebula so that you can eventually do even more kinds of nice processing. That's another key point that I make sure to highlight in Stretch Academy, which is that when you apply any of these stretching um, methods, typically it's not going to result in the final image. You're stretching the images in such a way that you are setting the stage for other contrast enhancements that you want to make. That's the important concept that I demonstrate in Stretch Academy. I demonstrate, you know, here's the good foundation, a stretched image, that we can move forward with and do things like HDRMT, which I demonstrate, as well as many of the other kind of contrast enhancements that are typically done with images. Notice here, and I have a video about this, but with this GHS stretched image, I'm able to maintain the color and detail within the center of the nebula, and of course, at the same time, show the outer realms of this wonderful object in the sky. And again, that is the kind of thing that shows a level of proficiency that you are going to want to achieve as far as stretching data is concerned. And I can show you how in my course. So I hope you'll consider checking out uh, the Stretch Academy. It's a new portion of uh, fundamentals, actually. So this is a part of the fundamentals portion of my website. You can get Stretch Academy all on its own. Currently, it's seven hours of material. And if you do so, and then you like it, you can go on and use what you spent. It's $70 currently for Stretch Academy. You can use that money to go towards buying fundamentals. So it's like a slow way of getting into fundamentals. If you already have, you're already a member of my site, you already have fundamentals, you already now have Stretch Academy. And I would highly recommend start viewing the content. It's good stuff. So thank you for the time today to show you a few things about stretching data and about uh, some of the core concepts that I am sure to cover within the material. And I hope you'll uh, consider giving it a shot.